I feel like just like everyone has quiet times and they journal. I started off journaling and then it kind of just went into songwriting. It's now, that's like my discipline is, it's not just journaling. There's something that Kaylee always says to me, your private worship is ultimately your, your corporate worship, how it stems together, almost like your ministry stems from your walk. I would say that it's not just something that I want to do. It's not just something that I feel like I should do. It's what the Lord says to do. Um, it says it so much in the word, just worship, praise, pray. That's what it says so many times, read, reading through Psalms, and it, it's something that we need to do for our own hearts and for the Lord. For me, it's a celebration. For me, it's an invitation. Worship is the reminder and my response for who the Lord is to me. So grateful for Taya uh, taking and giving us a little peek behind her own personal kind of prep. And part of what we want to uh, demonstrate or model in this uh, series is the way people sort of approach and leverage uh, their own personal disciplines to you know, um, reacclimate and to align themselves with what God is doing and wants to do. And last week we heard from uh, Nancy talking about on her commute into her office, she recites the fruits of the Spirit. We see Taya using words. Uh, she assumes everybody journals and everybody uh, does a quiet time, which I was glad to hear that. Uh, I assume that too. And um, we're gonna talk a bit more about that, but it's, it's, it's not so much that you have to journal, you have to write songs, you have to write poetry. It's the way in which we use our words. I wanna spend some time um, talking about that today. In fact, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about words and how we use words and language and narratives and all that over the past uh, few weeks. And, and I wanna just, as we get started, um, I was on a, a podcast a couple of weeks ago um, talking about what we would say to our congregations after the election. I was with several, uh, several pastors and um, a lot of other pastors listening in, what we would say to our congregations, uh, how to lead churches through chaotic um, election seasons and such. And um, the, uh, you know, uh, Megan Good was, she's a pastor from the Midwest and she was on there, she said this. And she said, this is what I'm gonna say to my congregation. I was like, now that's what I'm gonna say to mine as well. Um, she said, the main politic of a follower of Jesus is that Jesus is Lord. And the main place that politic plays out is in the church where we voluntarily give him our allegiance. The main politic for those of us who ascribe and follow Jesus is that Jesus is Lord. That's, that is our main politic, our main allegiance, and that gets played out, it gets fleshed out in this body called the church where we gather and we voluntarily give our allegiance um, to Jesus. I say that because I know today there are a lot of uh, folks who are here and you are like elated and others of you are here and you are disappointed. We have a church that is very, very diverse in its political spectrum. And I get all kinds of emails and texts, uh, quite interesting ones at times. But a lot of what I, I have, and, and we've been talking about for the last 14 or 15 weeks, really the last however many years, um, that when we talk about the kingdom of God, we are talking about something fundamentally different than the kingdom of this world. We are, it's fundamentally different. And so I got like multiple emails, multiple texts from people going, oh man, my hope is restored or oh man, my hope is lost. I'm like, have you not been listening to me for the last however long, right? And, and, and wherever you are, it's okay that you feel that way. That's not wrong or bad or anything else. It's just, that's not where our hope rests. When it says some men trust in, when the scriptures say some men trust in horses and some men trust in chariots, there are people who will trust in power and political power and the ability to wield the sword and all kinds of other things. But we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. When I, when I say that, it's because I really believe it. And when I lead our church in this direction, it's not because I'm afraid to offend somebody who's on the right or offend somebody who's on the left. It's because I actually believe that the way of Jesus is just different. And that's what I'm trying to pursue and trying to help us pursue. That's what we're doing together. 
Uh, in fact, I don't have time to get into that, but um, I think to me the beautiful part of this is that we have the opportunity to demonstrate and to experience unity that no system in this world can produce and to do it in a way that causes all of the world to stop and to notice and say, what is it that is different? What is it that is unique? What is it that is unifying about them? It's because we are unified around what has already been done for us and the world that has already been made available to us in Christ, and that's what we pursue. Um, my, my favorite quote in this whole election season is that the problem with the Christian right and the problem with the Christian left is it's exactly the same, that Christian becomes an adjective and the all-important God of political ideology. And what the church needs to be focused on is not changing the world, but rather living in the world that has already been changed by Christ. The kingdom has come, right? That's our posture. So I, I say that because I don't, I don't want to disparage the significance and the reasons to be excited about the future. And I also don't want to disparage or to diminish the people who feel anxious about the future. I just want to say that the future is not dependent on either one of those things. It's available for us as we walk and we trust in Christ. And that's what I want to talk about today is how is it that we process an encounter with God? Because that, that's what we need. That's what you need. That's what I need is for us to see God and to respond to him. And then everything else flows from that. I'm gonna share with you some of my own personal journey um, in that. So uh, if you've been around uh, very long, we're on the same page with that, right? At least for now, thank you. Maybe not, you can email me later. <laughs> I've, I've been for about 15 or 20 years, 18 years, somewhere around there, I've been using this frame this paradigm to understand how people become like they are. How did I become like I am? How is it that my life is expressed in this way? What happened? What, what formed me that caused that? And where or how did it get formed? We talk about encounter, formation, expression. It's that whatever you see will frame or determine the things that you do. It's all about what you set your sights on, what you allow to, to inform or to write or to narrate your story. Whatever you set your sights on, that's what um, will become or will cause you to become who you are. And so I wanna take a really careful look at this. Now, one of the things that we face that's unique about our culture, and this is the thing that I tried to do last week. I sat down and made a list after last Sunday. I said, these are the things I don't think I did well. There are about four of them. Uh, but there was something I thought I did really well last week, or at least, uh, at least I did like I wanted it to. And what I wanted for us to do is I wanted for us to believe and to trust that we are responsible for our attention, that you are responsible for the things that you pay attention to. We are not victims of the TV or Netflix or our phones or anything else. I had a lot of people tell me that, you know, man, I got off Instagram or I got off social media and it was really good and maybe you picked a good week to do that. But, um, but I'm not suggesting, I'm just suggesting that we learn how to steward the things we've been given and not become victims or slaves to them. That's what I'm pushing for. And it starts when we understand that we are stewards of our attention. You get a say in what you set your eyes on, what you set your affections on, believe it or not. That's what I wanna to try to help us understand and, and get to. And so the problem in our culture with, with what social media, what technology has allowed is it has caused the speed from encounter to expression to accelerate at a pace that our hearts cannot keep up with. So for example, if you saw something glorious in the 80s, like Journey or Def Leppard in concert or whatever your flavor of the day is, you would be like, yes! And you had to wait till the next day at school to wear your t-shirt and go like, man, that was so awesome. So you had like the whole night to ponder it, to think about it, to wake up thinking about it. And so at least it was like 14 hours. There was some distance. You had to kind of process what was happening, what you saw. You got to get your T-shirt out. You had to think about what you're going to wear. You know, all this kind of stuff. And then, then you were able to come back to school and go, I saw Journey or I saw whoever here it was. You, and you could like, I was like, oh, dude. And there was this kind of expression of that. And now it's like literally the moment you see something, you have the opportunity to express it, to send it out to the entire world. 
And not only do you have an opportunity, there's a pressure for you to do that. Somehow it's become the normative that what we see needs to immediately translate into our lives. And there's no slowing or disciplining of this process. And it doesn't mean that it's not happening. What it means is that it is happening without our attention and it is happening without our awareness and it is happening without our reflection and it is happening based on what we feel and not what is true. And this is where we've got to get to. Because when I think about this, I want, to, I want to slow this process down. I want to help us drive our encounter to this place that touches our hearts deeply. From Proverbs 4, which is where we read last week, I'm just going to read the whole passage again. It says, The path of the righteousness is like the morning sun. It gives us this imagery that it shines ever brighter until the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness, for they do not know what makes them stumble. The way of the wicked, the people who are, who, who are given in a way that is not directed by God or the things of God, that's what wickedness is. It's not just bad things, it's just ungod, non-godly, things apart from him. It's a trajectory towards death. It says they do not know what makes them stumble. And what it means is sometimes you gotta shine a light on it so you can actually see what it is that you keep stepping on or tripping over, over and over and over and over again. And then it gets really relational. It's a father talking to a son. In this room, we sang the song that says, I'm gonna lean back in the arms of a father. And this is the picture in my head is this tender, loving, you know, father, strong and uh, loving and gracious. And he looks and he says, my son, I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. My child, my daughter, I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. Turn your ears to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. Eat them, chew them, right? Bring them in. For they are life to those who find them. They are health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free from perversity or keep corrupt talk far from your lips. This is the idea, right? This isn't, perversity isn't just like sexual perversity. It's anything that twists the truth. It's anything that skews reality to your favor or your advantage. And let no corrupt talk uh, approach your lips or sit on your lips. There's a stewardship of our words that are required. For some of you read that and you're like, you can't say anything. (laughs) Just kidding. Let your gaze or let your eyes look straight ahead and fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in all of your ways. Do not turn to the right or turn to the left, but keep your foot from evil, it's, it's a call to pay attention. And he says specifically, above all else, guard your heart, because from right here comes everything else. And most of us have made very little time to protect our heart. So what ends up happening is your heart ends up protecting itself by growing harder and harder and harder. And that's not what it means to live with a guarded heart. A guarded heart means that we are free to give. We are free to avail. We are free to offer ourselves. We are free to express the fullness of the work that is being done in here based on what it is, hopefully we're gonna get to, that we encounter God in his beauty and his glory. We behold who he is and his love for us. And it forms and we become. And what I've found, because I have a... uh, some significant attention issues I have found that I'm gonna share with you today that the single most powerful way I have found to guard my heart is by waging this war in my mind. Thinking, learning how to, we'll talk more about that next week. But today I wanna kind of prequel that and give you some assignments or some help in understanding how we're gonna learn to think together. And that is in the discipline, what I call the discipline to describe something, to describe something. Um, I believe that that the words that we use, the things that we say are unbelievably telling about what's happening in our hearts and we scarcely pay attention to it in in, in the formative way. Uh, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 12, he said, Um, the mouth speaks where the heart is full of. So if you're always talking a bunch of bull, guess what that means about your heart? 
right? That's what it's full of. And this is just a picture that we get. But the reason is because of what we encounter, what we see, what we continue to look at, we continue to fixate on. In fact, to try not to draw the frog, I, I'm gonna just remind you that this is, this is seriously the thing. It is what you set your eyes on to fix your gaze. When he talks about directly in front of you, he's talking about on the way that is set out before us. This is the old covenant. But it ultimately, it was what Jesus would say to fix our eyes on him. We wanna talk about what that means. And as we do, I wanna tell you why words matter to me. Words matter to me for a lot of reasons. I'm gonna give you two reasons real quickly. But language is fundamentally, we, we think that language is fundamentally for the purpose of communication, and I don't think that's sufficient. I think language is primarily expressive. The words that we use are not designed to communicate principles or instructions to other people. They're designed to express something much deeper about who we are as human beings, about what's happening inside of us. That's why I try to treat language in words. And number two is the power of words is the power to create realities to actually create the reality that which you live in, the narratives that you live in and through over and over again. For some of you, right, the narrative of growing up is that you gotta perform or you're not approved. If you don't make good grades, if you don't perform in school, so your whole life, the narrative was that you gotta prove yourself every single day and you chase and you chase and you chase and you chase. It has established the reality within which you are currently living or have long lived, been living. Others of you, you heard that you're just not good enough and that narrative has either caused you to push and prove everybody else wrong or it's caused you to withdraw and to pull away and not take a chance anyway. Those narratives, those words create realities. Some of you people said harsh things to you as a child. Maybe it was from a parent or from someone at school. Others of you, the stories, the narratives you're hearing are framed by what you see on Instagram or, or social media or anywhere else. And it sort of establishes that your, your body image needs to look a certain way. And that's the narrative that you are living under. It has established the reality in which you live in. This is what creates and causes all kinds of problems. And it just runs amok because we don't pay attention to what's actually been said and what's actually available and what, what really lies at the heart, no pun intended, of what God actually wants to do. We, get, we have to get beyond assessing things as good or bad or right or wrong or fair or unfair and really mine for meaning in things. I've learned because I kind of make a living with words, <clears throat> at least a lot of people think that I do, is I'm very careful with them. But it's not because I'm a pastor or because I have a microphone. It's because I value relationships and I understand or have come to understand the power of words. I have rules, disciplines that I use when I deal with words. If I have to think about an email longer than five minutes, I'm calling them. If I get an email and I have to think about how am I gonna respond to this person without belittling them or sounding condescending or not saying the right thing or whatever, I'm gonna pick up the phone and call them. I don't ever write emails in my email software. I open up Evernote, which is or word, whatever your word processing thing is, or write them in a journal or wherever. Do you know why? Because you ever gotten an email, they're like, that's it, boom, send. And this way I have like four steps between writing the email and sending the email. I'll often print it out and look at it and read it. And if it takes me that much time, right, it's gonna be a phone conversation, that's my point. One of the other rules that I live by is I don't write anything down that I don't want someone to read a thousand times. I don't write anything down that I'm sending to someone, an email, a text, or anything else that I don't want someone to read a thousand times. My kids, the only text messages they have from me, my wife, the only text messages they have from me are encouraging they might be instructional. Hey, meet me at Moe's or wherever else we're going to, Epic, wherever we're going to dinner. Meet me, you know, it, it may be instructional, but, it's, but, it's, but there's never critique and there's never, there's never anything that uh, proves or puts them in their place because I don't want them reading it a thousand times and feeling condemned all over again. Never. It's just a rule, it's a discipline. Why? Because it's about stewarding our words. Because they create realities. Our culture has flat lost this. 
And I want for us as followers of Jesus to kind of grab this back. When God created the heavens and the earth, you know what he did? He did it with a word. Bruxy Cavey, I saw this this past week. He, he talks about this. And we live in a soundbite culture where if you say something that is bold and condemning, everybody's like, yeah, he spoke the truth without considering the, the complexity or the nuance. And it wasn't designed to proclaim the truth. It was designed to produce an emotion. He talks about the fact that outrage has become sort of the, the marker of moral superiority. And that what it is, is it highlights this idol of anger that we've all bought into. And all it is is evidence is that our emotions are being exploited. So it's not trying to get you to understand or trying to get you to get angry or to get fired up so that you engage in stuff. And we have a chance to do something different. We have misused words across the board. We don't steward them well. We, don't under, we underestimate their power. It's why most of us are frustrated by the fact you can't, get, you can't figure out what to actually believe because there's so many people using words to do nothing more than to project a particular view of seeing the world that may or that's gonna tilt it in their advantage and not necessarily concerned about what's real or true. And it happens, on, it happens everywhere. It's not unique to politics. It's everywhere. Church, I mean, I don't wanna get into that. But the, the words have become tools that we use to conceal or to manipulate, or they've become weapons to divide and ultimately to destroy. And y'all, what that has done is that has created the world in which we now live. And so that's why this is so important to me. And there are narratives, stories that drive your own realities. And what we can't underestimate is our brain's capacity to close loops or to write stories immediately. You know this, right? When someone pulls out in front of you or does something to you in traffic, I don't know how many of you guys are road rage people. Um, I'm sure some of you are. So, and, and, and listen, you know, Southeastern North Carolina is just famous for bad driving. And the reason is, it's, it's not any fault of our own. We just have slow Southern drivers like me who don't use their horns. And we have fast Northern drivers like some of you who always use your horns. And we're all on the same roads. And, and I don't drive fast enough for most of you. And some of you don't drive slow enough for me. And so it just all kind of mixes up. And then inevitably someone does something and they cut over in front of someone. And when someone cuts in front of you, when someone cuts you off in traffic, what is the default kind of response? It's like, oh. anybody throw your hands up? Just, bah. some of you, you're, 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 you're more nuanced than that, right? I know because I've, I've been on the receiving end. I'm like, you go to my church and you gave me the finger, I think. And so, so there's, this, there's this idea that, that, but here's the problem. Your, your emotional response, your emotional response is not to the action that they took. You don't go, oh, that person cut in front of me. They were a little bit close. Your emotional response comes from the story that your brain constructed. Is the person who cut in front of you, are they nice and polite and caring? Or are they a jerk who's just trying to get their way? Right? I mean, think about this. This is what happens to me. And my wife, she does this, like, as soon as like, I'll, I, I'm, I'm way better, but someone will do something. I'm like, oh my gosh. She said, Mike, they knew it was you. <laughs> they were doing that on purpose for you. Or she'll say, it's probably just a sweet young lady like our daughter who's just trying to get from one side of the town to the other and, you know, and it just changes the whole thing. But our brains construct these stories, these narratives so fast that immediately drive our reactions. And the only way I found, the only way I found to get to this place is to start describing and to pushing on the story to think about what I actually think about what is going on. The, dis the discipline to describe things is a discipline to harness language, to both understand some things and to express some things, to wrestle with some things and to submit some things. And ultimately for me, it has become the thing that helps me see the things that I don't readily see. The nuance that I've discovered on almost every issue that I've been wrestling with for probably since I was a pastor, people started asking me questions about, Mike, do you think this is right or do you think this is wrong? Is this biblical or is this unbiblical? The nuance that I have discovered on these issues is extraordinary. 
And in a lot of ways, it's beautiful for what God has been doing in me as I learned to see things in light of who he is. I started this years ago because I figured if I'm gonna pursue a career or job or vocation or education, I need to understand what it means or what I think about it. When I decided at a very early age I was gonna get married, I decided that I better learn to understand what it means to be married or have children, what it means to have children, what it means to be a father. I had to wrestle out if I'm gonna steward money, I need to understand and come to believe what do I believe about money? What do I believe about education? What do I believe about political systems? What do I believe about policy? What do I believe about sexuality? What do I believe about gender? What do I believe about alcohol? What do I believe, what do I believe about these things? And most of us just have an assessment. It's right or it's wrong. It's good or it's bad. And I think it's completely insufficient to deal with the culture that is in front of us that we live in. And I just don't think we have a lot of time or spend a lot of time paying attention to these things. And we all know that God is always working. We say that God is faithful and he's faithfully working. I think a lot of people believe that. A lot of people trust that. They would say they trust that. And my question would be, well, where is he? What is he doing? What is he doing? Our struggle to see God's work is often not his lack of, uh, of activity, even in our lives. It's just our lack of attention. We just don't have mechanisms to stop and to pay attention. The speed between encounter and expression is too great. and We don't understand what God is doing in our hearts. My solution, and you knew this was coming because I brought my handy dandy little journal. My solution is to write. I don't write to write books. I don't write to publish. I don't write for anyone else's eyes. I write because I need to learn how to describe what I'm seeing. One of my favorite uh, TV shows uh, is Chopped. You may watch Chopped. It's Food Network. It's a competition. They open these baskets. People would give crazy ingredients, you have to make something and present it back to these judges. And I love watching food shows. I'm not even that much of a foodie. I, I'm coming to enjoy food. My palate has been refined slightly from what's former middle school boy condition, but it's slightly improved. But I love, one of my favorite judges is Jeffrey Zakarian. Have you seen Jeffrey Zakarian? He's like, he's like so perfectly presented all the time. And when he's like tasting the food, they taste it. If you notice, they take their fork and they turn it upside down and they do it this way. I've tried this before. It doesn't do any good, but they, they do this. And then he goes, oh, that's very assertive or it's got a hint of smokiness, but it's a little subdued and it's, I'm like, what are you talking about? You put a plate in front of me and say, Mike, taste this. I'm like, mm, that's good or mm, that's not good. That's about it. I have nothing more than that. Do you know Why? Because I live my life assessing whether something is good or bad or right or wrong instead of actually trying to articulate what I am tasting. And these, we get these, we, the, the, the big problem in cultures, we get these straw dogs, right? these polar opposites, where is it right or wrong? Without any capacity to actually nuance, there's something more to it than that. And everything else is designed to inflame us. So I write. I use words, I put them down on paper. I write about things that I think about. I write down things that I, questions that I have, doubts that I have, fears that I have, struggles that I have, questions that I have. What I've learned is I am not afraid of any question. I can write it down, I can think about what I think about, and I can be wrong about it before God. So I'm gonna give you, these are four reasons why I'm not a writer. I don't write because I'm a writer. Um, I write because it's the only way I've found that I can pay attention to the condition of my heart that is required for me to identify what is actually happening there. It's just the only way. Does the Bible say thou shalt journal? Nope, just Mike. Mike says that. Four reasons, and then we'll read this, and we'll be, read this past we'll be done. Number one, writing my thoughts convinces my mind that I'm serious about slowing down. Henry Nouwen wrote my favorite quote on the mind. He says, I journal, I write, think, I write down my thoughts in order to tell my mind monkeys where to go. There's never been a dis better description for my brain than that. Do you ever feel like you can't get settled? You sit down, 
Maybe it's after work. Maybe it's the first thing in the morning. Maybe it's later at night. You just sit down. You just try to get yourself settled down. Maybe you wanna read. Maybe you wanna do your quiet time. You just can't get your mind settled down. I open up my journal and I open up my Bible and I write out the verses that I'm reading with my hand. You know what I'm doing? I'm telling the mind monkeys, sit down and behave. I'm gonna have a conversation with God. Stop. It is the stewardship of my attention. Number two, writing my thoughts then allows me to see what I am thinking without being blinded by what I'm feeling. I'm not suggesting for a moment that you shouldn't feel and you shouldn't feel deeply. I'm just saying that you, cannot be, you can't be just subject to the exploitation of your emotions. One of the markers of spiritual maturity is that we learn to live stably without being blown here and there by everything that comes along. Number three, writing gives me a tangible way to submit what I see to God. I'm not afraid of my plans anymore. I, I recognize that God often laughs at them, but I'm not afraid of them. Number four, writing helps me see my own story unfold. I can go back and read with my own handwriting desperate prayers for health concerns in a kid or desperation for something in a family or struggles in my own head and heart that I thought, God, if you can just do this, then everything will be okay. And I remember the, the, the fear and the angst of those emotions and saying, God, here you go. I remember the tension of deciding whether or not to leave one place and start something new and all the uncertainty that comes into that. And to see God's faithfulness in it, to see his faithfulness, even when things didn't work out like I w thought they should. We're gonna talk about that on Tuesday night, my friends at Overflow. But it's to use words. Psalm 34, eight says this, it says to taste and see, there's this to taste and see that the Lord is good. Without words, you don't get to see this unfolding story of your life. And we readily agree, right? We taste and see, oh, of course he's good. He is good, but we have little ability or rather we make little effort to describe what it is that we are tasting. And we end up just repeating the same old narrative of our lives over and over again. Some of you are students and you're just starting to write yours. Your stories are still fresh, but there's an outline that is being formed. Things have already happened to you. For some of you, there's a fear that every time you feel like you're sad that you're going off the cliff and there's no way for you to resolve or to reconcile that. It's beginning to lay foundations upon which your life will be built and the fears are threatening you. And what this does, it begins to frame how you respond to opportunities that are in front of you or to the obstacles that you face. And you need words to say, this is what this is or this is what I'm sensing about this or how, God, do you want me to perceive this? What is God doing? And the most beautiful thing about this, this isn't about you just coming up with a power of positive thinking or some you know, mantra you can chant over about how you're good enough and smart enough or whatever. This is a way for you to stop and have an encounter with God to understand that he is the one who has created you and called you and it is his story that he wants your story to be a part of. And here's where it's found. I'm gonna read this and we'll be done in Jeremiah chapter one, verse four. This is the call of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was obviously a young guy, as young, uh, young in age at this point in his life, and he records this from his own, in his own hand, or actually the hand of a scribe, but you get the idea. Verse four, the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah's writing, before I knew you, or sorry, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. I had a call and a plan and a purpose for you, Jeremiah. And here's Jeremiah's response. Alas, sovereign Lord, I don't know how to speak and I am too young. You've got the wrong person. I'll tell you one thing, this is just kind of free. If, you, if God ever calls you to anything, your first response will be, you got the wrong person. 
because that's just how we feel. And the reason is because of the narratives that are played over and over and over again in our hearts and in our minds and the things that have been said to us or spoken to us or in some cases repetitively and spoken over you. So Jeremiah's response is the same old narrative that he's always used. Why don't you do this? Because, and here's my reasons, it became his excuse to why he refused to step into the future of the call. For some of you, it's your sense of worth that you just can't ever get beyond. And every time something good happens, you end up sabotaging it because you just keep replaying the narrative. You've not heard a new story that is available to you in an encounter with God. And here's what God says to him. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I don't wanna hear it. I don't wanna hear your tired old story. Do not say that you are too young. You must go to everyone I will send, send you to and say whatever I command you. And I love this in verse eight. Do not be afraid of them for I'm with you and I'll rescue you. If, if someone invites you to go somewhere and say, I'm gonna be with you and I'm gonna rescue you, <laughs> that means wherever they take you is gonna get you in trouble that you're gonna need to be rescued. Just, just, wow, it's pretty cool. Then this next part, it says, then God didn't try to convince him or give him 14 reasons why Jeremiah is good and smart. The Lord reached out his hand and he touched my mouth. And he said to me, I've put my words in your mouth. See today, I will appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Then he asked this question to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came. He said, what do you see? We get it in one sentence. I think it was like there's this encounter, this exchange, and then he gets and he calls and says, this is what I want you to do. He touches his mouth. He says, now, Jeremiah, what do you see? I don't know if Jeremiah thought for a minute, if he wrote down in the dirt. I don't know what he did. I don't think he was flippant. And he said, I see the branch of an olive tree. And the Lord said to me, you've seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. He's not, it's not for I'm watching you to make sure you get it right. He's basically saying, I'm gonna be with you and I've called you and I take responsibility for that which I have called and created and I'm inviting you into this. What I want for you to understand what we're gonna do here, we're gonna continue this next week, but what we're gonna do is I want you to understand that your past experience does not dictate your future story. An encounter with God does. It's not gonna be because you figure, it's gonna be because you actually encounter, you see him. And what I want for you to do is have some words to describe this. Positive thoughts aren't enough, rehearsing, you know, even to say, here's the truth, replace this lies on you, you got to see God. What happened is Jeremiah, God touched Jeremiah's lips. This was an act of intimacy. It was an act of authority. Right? I know COVID has kind of messed this up, right? No one's gonna touch your mouth now, but even pre-COVID, imagine someone walking up and just touching your lips. You're like, pap. It's a very intimate thing. And he did this in order to place something on him. He met him to, to give to him, to offer to him, to invite him into something. It's an act of intimacy and authority. It's an act of call. It's an act of purifying and reminding. So I wanna give you these four questions. They're gonna be, or five questions. They're gonna be on our uh, um, social media and, and such this week for you. But I would like for you to take some time to reflect on them, to put some words, to describe your answers to these questions. Question number one, are there stories that keep you from trusting? Maybe you need to go back and revisit maybe God's call on you. Maybe a time when you've met him. Are there stories that you believe that keep you from trusting him, from God or anybody for that matter? Are there stories that you believe that keep you chasing and pursuing and relentlessly dissatisfied? Did someone say something or do so? Are there stories that you just, that just keep repeating themselves? How would you describe what you see about God? How would you describe what you see about God? Is he up there? The big man upstairs? Is he close? Is he kind? How, what would you say about God? What would you say about your own life? 
What would you say about your own life? Most of us, you would qualify yourself more than likely in a spiritual direction, probably negatively. I should read the Bible more. I should pray more. And what you have done is you have said, is this right or wrong, good or bad? And I want you to describe it. Don't, don't sell yourself short in that. How would you articulate the story that God is telling of your life? Of your life. How would you articulate the story that God is telling through your life? Sometimes when I feel the pressure to have something great to say or whatever it is, um, the thing that I always remind myself of is that what I need more than anything, and tell you, I mentioned their story, is that your public worship is always an expression of your private worship. We say it around here that your ministry is always an expression of your walk. My ministry in the public arena is always an expression of my own private relationship with the Lord. And so I tend to that as a matter of first priority in everything without, with, with, without compromise because it's that important. And sometimes when I feel the pressure because of the demands that are on my time, and I know you have them as well, instead of giving in to them and going, oh my gosh, I gotta write this. Oh my gosh, I gotta email this. Oh my gosh, I gotta do this. Oh my gosh, I gotta prepare for this meeting. Oh my gosh, I got all these things that are pulling at me all the time. I try to stop this train and get some space and some time and some quiet to get everything still and to know that He is good and to describe His goodness and to reflect on His goodness and to believe in His goodness and to trust in His goodness. And I actually have ways in which I describe this. So I wanna share a little bit of kind of what that looked like for me. And I wanna use that to read this as a benediction over us. I don't want you to get all excited about journaling, although I want you to. I want you, I don't want you to get all excited about the possibility for your future being this cool story, although that's possible. I want for you to have an encounter with God, to see Him speak to you intimately, kindly, with authority, and with tremendous purpose and faithfulness to accomplish it. So I had to sit down and, and I just used Ephesians 3. And I just wrote it out. And this is kind of how, what I wrote as I just reflected and tried to say, God, I wanna use words to recall and to recount and to enter in to what I hear you saying to me. It starts off and it says, all of us, me, all of us, we're dead in our trespasses. Our allegiance, my allegiance was misplaced and it was misgiven. I put my hope in other things. I followed anything that caught my eye. That's true for all of us. I bought in, I enjoyed, I've envied the way of indulgence, gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and the thinking that goes with it. Like everyone, I deserve to be an enemy. I deserve to be punished. In fact, sometimes I even punished myself but because of God, He is the cause. Because of His great love for me, He, who is rich in mercy, made me alive with Christ, even when I was content to live in the deadness that surrounded my transgressions. It is by His grace that I have been rescued and God raised me up with Christ, uniting me in His eternal perspective, which is required in order to get a glimpse of the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in kindness towards me that are demonstrated, that are seen, and that are experienced in my relationship with Christ. 
That is a true thing. For it is by grace that I've been saved, by trusting and by receiving, not by proving and not by earning. So I am free to cease striving. Relax. There's no need to justify or present your resume. This is what I heard him say to me and I hope you'll hear him say this to you. He's made you, he's intended you. He touches your lips with a call and with a purpose, a masterpiece, perfectly positioned to express the very image of the one for whom you have been made as we give ourselves for him and to one another. Words create realities. Stories. Father, my prayer is not that we would have a clarity of what our lives are gonna be like 10 years from now, but rather we would have an encounter with you Maybe it's goosebumps. Maybe it's, I can't believe Mike's talking to me. Whatever that thing that's happening. My prayer is that you would imprint that on our heart. Allow us to reflect on it, to describe it, to consider it. Because it is shaping us. You are shaping us. We don't want to miss it. God, I pray for those who are here who have been harmed by horrendous stories. May your touch be healing and may it be freeing. For those who are plagued with kind of chronic choice patterns or addiction patterns, may your touch be kind of chain breaking, worth giving. Whatever we need, let that be your touch put your call, your word, your voice on our lives, that our lives may be offered for you. And I ask all this in your son, Jesus. Amen.